sorts of things into the atmosphere, some of which we now know are extremely dangerous, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons to deplete the ozone layer, and some of which we probably haven't been smart enough to figure out yet. And uh, it's just that in the long term, we may make a serious mistake. I don't by any means think it's inevitable, and uh, I think we ought to devote to, uh, the most heroic efforts to making sure we preserve this beautiful planet. But at the same time, it's wise to hedge your bets, to, uh, as conservatives say, uh, diversify our portfolio. And uh, having self-sustaining human communities on other worlds in the long term seems to me uh, wise and prudent. Now, on the question of cost, if we bear in mind that we're talking about a very long time scale, and if we also bear in mind that the joint space programs of the spacefaring nations are extremely powerful if we were to have coordinated... If we could pool the resources. Yeah. If we could pool the resources, both fiscal and intellectual, uh, then you, you just do the numbers and you see that it's perfectly possible to do without even increasing budgets. Do you understand why you're having so apparently such difficulty or uh, anticipating difficulty with the religious right or religious... I, mean, I, I, don't. I don't. I have no difficulty with them. Uh, at least uh, I have heard absolutely nothing. You, you, you mean some of the discussion in the early part of failed yeah. that? Yeah, no, I, I haven't heard a thing. They're not, not offended by the idea that we have looked at the creator of the universe and isn't it a coincidence he looks just like me? Uh, I do say something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah in, I in paraphrase, <laughs> but, but it's close. In, in the con- it is. In the context of, uh, of the prevailing human conceit that we are not just at the center of the universe physically and metaphorically, but that we are the point of the universe, the reason there is a universe. And if you think of the scale that I tried to describe at the yeah. very beginning of the program, uh, all those stars and galaxies, the idea that we are the center and the point of the universe is pathetic. It's so obviously a conceit and uh, maybe was sustainable a few thousand years ago, because after all, the stars do seem to rise and set around yeah. us. I mean, that is the, the sort of straightforward explanation of naked eye astronomy. But uh, we now know much more than, than that. Many religions are perfectly happy with the findings of modern of modern science and um, even uh, well, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be possible? I think there was a, somebody wrote in the New York Times that the, the, the people of a religious conviction could take the the revelations and reminders of revelations in in your book and reinforce their own beliefs. I mean, it, it makes if there is a creator, the creator is much more awesome than even than our than our minds had dared to presume. That's a few just years ago. just what I argue in in Pale Blue Dot that that if the universe is more magnificent, glorious, intricate subtle, beautiful than we had thought. And if you want to believe in a creator, does this not make the creator more magnificent, subtle, elegant, and so on? What's what's the problem? Why is there a problem? The problem is, if you uh, believe that a book written 2,500 years ago is the end-all and be-all of our knowledge, uh, then what's in that book is in contradiction with the clearest findings of modern science, and then you're in trouble. But if you don't believe that it is, it is religion's job to uh, make uh, authoritative pronouncements on the way the universe is, then your religion is, is enhanced by the findings of science. Of science. What's on Titan? <coughs> <coughs> Titan is an extremely uh, interesting place. Uh, um, organic matter, the stuff of life, yeah. is falling from the skies of Titan like manna from heaven. There's so much of it that we can't see through to the surface of Titan. It's, it's socked in. <coughs> and recently, um, um, Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based radar data have begun to fill in our information on the nature of the surface. But a key question is still unresolved, whether there are oceans of liquid hydrocarbons on the surface. Uh, and we don't yet know the answer to that. But isn't it astonishing If you want to know something about the chemistry of the origin of life, go to the big moon of Saturn. Who would have figured that that's where we can learn about our own origins? And yet, that's the way it now looks. But that's that's next door in terms of, in in universal terms. 
Oh, I mean, ab- Titan's uh, just down the street. From uh, here. Uh, absolutely, although it's... And you're that close, and there's the other possibility of origins of life. Oh, oh no, no, no question. So then multiply that by all those hundreds of billions of other planets, and uh, you have some hint of what else may be possible. No diamonds on Mars, though, eh? Well, there has been a serious... Uh, <laughs> you know, you've read this book very carefully, I must say. Uh, there has been a suggestion in the scientific literature that... Uh, there may be lots of diamonds on Mars, but it is a mere suggestion, and I would not think it would justify a program of exploration of Mars by itself. Uh, there but are you pl- think plenty of other we should have, we should explore well, Mars. Absolutely, a world of wonders. And uh, speaking about the, the origin of life, despite the fact that Mars is uh, arid and frozen and desolate today, as far as we know, four billion years ago, it was warm and wet. There were rivers, there were lakes, there may even have been oceans. Now, four billion years ago is a very important time for our planet. That's the time of the origin of life. And so, isn't it possible that on the next door planet, when conditions were very similar to what they were here, life arose there also? And if so, is that life still hanging on in refugia, uh, oases somewhere on Mars? Or is it extinct and awaiting uh, the search for chemical and morphological fossils? Uh, the possibilities are extremely exciting uh, about Mars as well. As well. What do I look like from Mars? A parasite? Uh, you are part of an extremely thin film of life that but, but covers you, the do, surface. Do your resolution to within one meter act with the, the, <laughs> the top. Uh, with okay, the, well, you really well, see that the Earth is a pale blue dot, and I'm a parasite, and my car is the dominant creature. <laughs> <laughs> from Mars, um, even with a large telescope, uh, you see continents and oceans and clouds, maybe mountains and rivers. You certainly do not see life. If we were to improve our resolution, our ability to see fine detail, uh, it is only when we get uh, to uh, 100 meter and better resolution that even the artifacts of our civilization become apparent. Even the sky dome? Uh, yes. And it's not just a question of being able to resolve it, but does it have contrast with its surroundings? Because if the contrast yeah. is poor, you can't see it anyway. And what, what I'm describing is the result of uh, satellite and space probe uh, investigations of the Earth. Yeah, there was one you'd had them turn around and take a l- quick little snapshot. Yeah, before. I'll come, I'll, I'll come to that. Big, I'll come to that. Little just, click, and then off it goes forever. But humans, to to see humans, you would have to be down to better than a, a meter resolution, which is uh, we don't have many pictures of that sort. We are not, and even our artifacts are not very detectable. The title of the book, Pale Blue Dot, comes from the fact that the Voyager spacecraft whipped through the solar system, opened up the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune systems for us, and are now on their way to the stars after they pass Neptune. Uh, 